Good morning, everybody. Would you stand with us? It is good and pleasing to come together and to worship the Lord. So would you put your hands together? You can raise your hands, open up your mouth. Break into the wild and don't be afraid. Run into wide open spaces, graces waiting for you. Dance like the weight has been lifted, graces waiting. can be seated but come on you say the word freedom you can't say it like freedom freedom 
where the Spirit of the Lord is. And P.S. Spirit of the Lord is here and here today. So let's celebrate freedom. Welcome, DC3. So great to be here today. I, I, um, I, did, th I did this in the first service, and then I said to Sandy, hey, how'd I, how'd I do? Because I haven't done this in a while. He said, you just missed one thing. Real love, real people. I'm like, seriously? Like, I've heard it every day for three years, and I've, I forgot to say one of the most important things for all of us here is around DC3, we say that, and maybe it's just because I hear it so much. Real love, real people. Based on uh, the, the core of the Gospels, when Jesus said, love your neighbor Love, love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And the second commandment, love your neighbor as yourself. That's what we believe around here uh, and do our absolute best to be real love to real people because we are real people. Another thing you will notice if you're brand new here and you've never been here before, which if that's the case, welcome. Please fill out a connection card. You'll find it on the back of the seat in front of you. Uh, you can pull that out, fill that out. That would be great. Uh, unless you're sitting in the front row, you can't access one of those except if you turn around and get, person behind you will help you. Uh, fill that out. We'd love to have a record of your visit uh, and, and kinda um, just be there to help you with any questions that you might have. And you will also notice that uh, we don't pass an offering plate. Um, that's just not what we do, but if you're here and you would like to give, there is a giving station out in the lobby that you can give. You can also text to give, uh, just text the word give to 941-208-0078, and you can give that way as well. How many of you are glad that of all the places you could be, you're here? So, we're glad you are, you're glad you are, so now it's time to just let you know some things that are coming up, so if you can direct your attention to the screen and watch these announcements, we'd appreciate it. Due to an overwhelming demand for people in need of food, our local food pantry is struggling to keep food on the shelves. DC3 family, this is an amazing opportunity to come alongside our neighbors and help a local church that supplies food to over 1,000 people in our community. All non-perishable items are okay. Here are a few that are needed most. That's weird. Please bring these items to all services at both campuses, Sunday, October 10th, and Sunday, October 17th. Any questions, contact Brandy at btown at dc3.tv. Our memory verse for the month of October is Psalm 139, 14. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. We encourage you to memorize this verse and to follow along with us on our weekly reading plan, available on the social media and the My DC3 app. Come join us at the first annual DC3 Festival of Fall. Oh yeah, it's for all ages and everyone in our community. There will be free food, carnival houses, wait, carnival games, bounce houses, giveaways, and fall fun. That's, there it is, right there. It's gonna be even more funner than that. Yep, so bring your friends and neighbors. For invites, stop by the Big Blue Tent in Punta Gorda and the Welcome Center in Northport. Actually, just stop by one of those places. You don't have to go by both. Just pick one. We really are glad to be here today. Why don't you stand up, put a real big smile on your face and greet those that are around you. Just let them know how good it is to see them. Hey, 
All right, all right. Repeat after me. Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna need your uh, outdoor voices to repeat after me today, okay? I know you're indoors, but John 3, 16. Wow. So, I have two boys, and when they're outdoors, they're a lot louder than that. By the way, when they're indoors, they're a lot louder than that. Let's try that again. Ready? John 3, 16. Okay. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever, and get that again, that whoever believes in him will not die but have ever lasting life.
Jesus is waiting. God so loved the world. I don't want you to miss that this morning. What are the things that are keeping you from recognizing this amazing love of God? What are the failures? I'm my own worst enemy, I'll tell you right now, my own worst enemy. So what I will do is I will say, God, you can't use this. God, I'm disqualified because of this. You ever have those words? You ever have those thoughts? But God, there's no way, there's no way you can use me. <laughs> and you know what he says? Yeah, he says this right here. I love you. Then he says, So bring all your failures, bring your addictions, come lay them down at the foot of the cross. Because Jesus is waiting. God so loved the world. Come on, sing it again with me. And bring them. And bring all your failures, bring your addictions, come lay them down. Jesus is waiting, God so loved the world. We want to live right there for a little bit. We want to let the Spirit just work and just, we're, we're just tilling the soil right now. Because I believe God has something for us, something that's so much bigger than what we thought might even be for us coming in. God's going to keep turning that soil today. That soil is just, we're, we're getting in there now. One more time with me. So bring all your failures, bring your addictions, and come lay them down at the foot of the cross. Who's there? Jesus is waiting. God so loved. We're going to keep letting you till that up and the spirit work in us as we watch this next video. Feel free to have a seat. I just wanted to die. You know, that's basically my testimony. Um, I was sick in and out of hospitals. I went to Lee, all the Lee memorials, saw them all, saw the doctors. I did more medical tests than I know what to do with uh, spinal fluid, drugs, poison, worms, it all. And then they sent me to Weston, Cleveland Clinics. And when I got there, I looked at my mom. Doctor gave me the, gave me basically the seal of, of approval. I was like half asleep and he just said, I don't think he's gonna make it. We can't find what's wrong, but I just, I don't see him making it. He's, he's in rough shape. They had me on 24 seven cameras, EEGs. They were checking everything. They were trying to cause the symptoms. I'd have vertigo. I'd sleep for, there was days I wouldn't sleep for two, three days. There was days I'd sleep 48 hours, like three, four days. Sometimes I'd eat like 10 people. Sometimes I wouldn't eat for a few days. Just a bunch of crazy symptoms, never felt good. I was a runner, marathon runner, cross country runner, had no strength. Just kind of lost the will to live. My dad just couldn't do it anymore. He was done, he was dead. He just, he was tired of it. He just, he physically couldn't do it or emotionally. I looked at my mom, I said, hey mom, I don't want any more hospitals. Get me a dog and just let me die, and let me die in peace. You know, let me relax. You know, my mom's like, hey, I know you don't want to do hospitals. My grandma's like, hey, you want to go to church? And I went to a church, I didn't like it, I left. I said, no, nah, this is, this." I was sick. I said, I don't feel good, I just want to leave. And um, then my mom's like, hey, I got this voodoo doctor. I said, all right, man, let's go do some voodoo. Will it make me feel better? Yeah, yeah. And my mom had to go do something. She had to go run and grab something from him. And he was talking to me, and I always wore a cross. I still have the chain, but it was a cross on the chain. Got, got on the cross, and uh, he would always flip the cards, and he'd talk to me, and he, he says, 
He's like, I know I can fix you. I know you're, you're, you're cursed. I know the devil's after you, but you got somebody praying for you. He said, Grandma, you got to stop praying for me. You got to just let me do the voodoo and let me feel good. She says, nah, that voodoo's not, not what you need. And um, my dad used to own a restaurant and his brother, psychologist. So my dad's like, hey, he's a psychologist. Come talk to a maker. And he'd come talk to me about once, twice a week. And I always felt good. I didn't realize until later on why I'd feel good. He'd run these tests and I'd always tell dad, man, I just feel so good around Eker. I feel, I, I don't feel the symptoms. I feel strong. I feel like my old me. I, I would tell him, he's like, well, I don't know. I guess Eker's doing something right with the psychology. I said, he must be. Later, he comes to me and says, hey, Selvin, um, I don't know if you want to do it, but I've been praying for you. I've been fasting for you. Um, you know, I've been I've been really with the Lord for you. Uh, just just wanting the Lord to, to to tell me what we need to do for you. And uh, I've been praying for you, and, and I love you, and God loves you. I said, man, don't talk to me about no God. You know, he was my spiritual father. He still is to this day. And, um, you know, he says, hey, God told me, um, you know, do you accept God as your, as your Lord and Savior? I said, I'm hesitant. I said, I oh, don't know, man. I just don't know. He says, well, God told me that we need to take you to a Brazilian pastor. He'll pray for you, and I know you'll get better. I said, I don't believe that, but you know what, man? It's worth a shot. I'm going to die anyway, so my motto was, let me shoot it one more time for my parents. You know, kind of that last hope. All of a sudden, he's praying. I feel even worse. I'm like, man, this ain't working. And uh, then I remember, I hear the voice. We got, I'm here with you. You know, I got you in my hand. And I said, okay, let's do this. And he's praying, he's praying. So I remember seeing white coming in, dark coming out. And I'll always take it as, and then I asked God, I said, why is that? He says, well, it's the darkness leaving you and that's the Holy Spirit coming into your life. I saw something beautiful that day. Never remember, most beautiful thing I've ever seen. Uh, more beautiful than my wife. And my wife's gorgeous and my little girl. Um, but just a beautiful thing and, and he's praying. And I remember them saying, hey, Selvin, I'm with you, and I'll be with you for the rest of your life. And right there, instant peace. Um, I felt completely peaceful at the time. And, and God just says, you know, I'm here with you. I am your God. And that's when he said it. And I said, OK, you're my God. And then he says, just listen to, listen to my words. You know, he told me you're going to go through all, 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 parts of the, all, all parts of the world. Right then, I'm like, all parts of the world? I said, I'm petrified of planes. I do not, I get anxiety getting on a plane. You know, I got severe anxiety. And he says, now you're going to do it. And I remember him saying, he says, in the most broken vase is where the light shines through the most. And uh, I remember uh, the love I felt for Jesus after that was like no other. I remember the, the pastor ends. He says, the word gives the prophecy. You know, my dad's crying, man, I'm crying, I don't cry. Uh, my mom's crying. My grandma, she's typical grandma, jumping up and down, screaming, clapping. You know, typical grandma. And uh, I remember God saying, run. You know, I was always a runner. And I, I ran for 30 minutes. And I, I, he said, keep running. I, I'm telling you, I've never ran so happy in my life after about a year of not feeling your legs, feeling your arms to go out and run for 45 minutes around the church where you're not supposed to run. My testimony and the way he saved me was completely different than a lot of people. A lot of people say, hey, you know, God, God saved me through this. Well, no, God, God had to hit me so hard and drop me down so bad to the point where I knew that only he could lift me up.
God, a Prince of Peace. Lord, burn it in our hearts today. Burn it in our minds today. Whose presence are we in? There is no one like our God. There is no one but the one true God, Jehovah, Jireh, Yahweh, the Almighty One. Lord, I pray that we would get a sense and a reverence for your presence. Because things happen in your presence that can't happen anywhere else. I am thankful for doctors. I am thankful for psychologists. I'm thankful for counselors. I'm thankful for hospitals. I'm thankful for the EMT that we have. But they can't touch what you can do, Lord. God, we get all flustered in the presence of other humans. Pleasing man is a snare. We get all flustered in the presence of some great celebrity or sports person, somebody that has a lot of money or a lot of power. And sometimes we treat your presence with such irreverence. But today, Lord, I bow in repentance and I pray our hearts at DC3 would bow in repentance, whether we physically get on our knees right now or not, but our hearts would bow in the presence of the King. That I just don't sing these words. This just keeps coming over and over to me over the last few weeks. Am I just giving lip service? Yeah, way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper. As Brian said, freedom, woohoo. Or is that way maker making a way in my life that I can't make on my own? Is that promise keeper proving to be true as I get to know him more and more and more that he is faithful? He is true. He is kind. He is good. He is patient. Help us, Lord to not just sing a song and hear a good message and get our hearts all stirred up and get emotional and then leave and be the same people we were when we walked in this place. This is the greatest hospital. It's the greatest plastic surgeon you could ever go to. Think about that. He takes a heart that is completely selfish, self-centered, prideful, addicted, worried, fearful, and most of all dead, at the end of the day dead, and he transforms it into life and goodness and beauty and joy and peace that passes all understanding. Oh God, help us to please you. The fear of man is a snare. Pleasing man is a snare, but the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. So Lord, do what only you can do. We're nothing without you. We're nothing without you. May your presence whew, clean us out. Transform us into the people you've called us to be. For such a time as this, it's urgent. It's urgent. He's coming soon. We bow, we bow before the King. Choose to do it today before you're forced to do it one day. Jesus, we love you, Waymaker. Waymaker. Hallelujah. In Jesus' name, Jesus, holy and awesome and mighty and powerful, soon coming King. We love you. And would you join me and say amen, clap, whatever your heart feels today. Thank you, Lord. Receive our worship today. Clean hands and a pure heart. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. So as we continue in worship, you may be seated. Nearly 
all of us know that Jesus had 12 core disciples. Though there were others that followed him, these 12 men were specifically selected to remain with him during his time of ministry on earth. Of the 12, we want to focus on one in particular. His name was Thomas. Thomas had a nickname, Didymus. Didymus means twin. We have no idea why he's called this as there's no indication that Thomas had a twin. It could be that he bore a strong resemblance to Jesus. One uninspired and apocryphal letter suggests that Thomas was Jesus' twin, but we know by the rest of God's word that this is completely untrue. Unfortunately, we have come to know him as Doubting Thomas. He is mentioned as one of the twelve in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and Acts. But it is his depiction in the Gospel of John that gives him his legacy. We see by his dialogue in John 20 that he wants proof that the resurrected Christ is actually who he says he is. When the other disciples tell him Jesus is risen, Thomas dismisses this idea. He says that he won't believe Jesus is actually alive unless he can physically see the nail and spear wounds in Jesus' body. When Thomas gets the proof he requested, he immediately recognizes Jesus as who he claims to be. Though he has a bad rap for one moment of struggle, Thomas had shown a lot of bravery and leadership at one point. When the Jews were seeking to kill Jesus and he was heading toward the angry mob in Judea, Thomas rises up and says to the other disciples, let us also go so that we may die with him. That account is found in John 11 and is hardly the declaration of someone who would simply be remembered as a doubter. When Luke lists the apostles in his writings, he couples Thomas with Matthew in his gospel and with Philip in the book of Acts. It's possible that Thomas worked closely with both of these apostles. Now, according to tradition, Thomas took the gospel to India where he was martyred. History tells us that he died by spear it is interesting to note that Jesus' spear wounds were the evidence Thomas needed to believe. In the end, Thomas' spear wounds became the evidence of his faith in Jesus as Messiah. <laughs> now that is a story. All right, good morning, everyone. How y'all doing? Turn to somebody beside you and say, we're going to talk about Thomas. You're like, if you're not Southern, you would just went, what the heck did he just say? We are going to talk about Thomas. We Southerners like the shortcut. We're going to talk about Thomas. That's, that's uh, how fast we like to say it. Today, today, we're going to talk about two subjects. We're going to talk about faith. Everybody say faith, faith. and doubt. All right, so some of you are here today at the invite of some amazing people, and you might consider your pers your, yourself not a person of faith. And I want to tell you right up front, I am so thankful that you are here. Some of you say, I am definitely a person of faith. Uh, some of you are kind of in between. I'm a person of faith, but not radical about it. And, and everybody with me right there? So I'm going to do a little illustration for you. I've got my cool little beach ball here. I got to make sure I hang on to it because when I let it go, it's going to float to the ceiling. Right? You're, you guys ready? Drum roll on your, on your knees. My youth ministry days, come on. Some of you have no faith whatsoever. You're like sitting there like, get on with it. So stop this. How many believe this is going to float to the ceiling? Raise your hand. John, I love you, man. Nobody else? How many of you say, if you believe me, I'll give you 20 bucks? How many believe that it's going <laughs> to... What you got to lose, right? <laughs> All right. How many you go, I have my doubts about it floating to the ceiling. Raise your hand. 
How many of you are nihilistic? That means there are no meaning to any of this, so you'll never raise your hand, right? <laughs> Life has no... <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm praying for you. All these doubters, so here we go. I'm, I'm going to prove my doubters wrong. Everybody, drum roll, please. Here we go. <laughs> Ready? One, two, three. <laughs> but, Cliff, where you at, Cliff? Cliff Cliff's going Cliff's to help me out here. There you go, bro. There you go. All right, I got it. Now how many believe it's going to go to the ceiling? Raise your hand. Yeah, no, sorry. <laughs> Faith and doubt. Some of you don't put your trust in Steve. Put it in Jesus. Amen, we're done. No, I'm just kidding. Here, here's the moral of that story. How many thought it would fall? How many think if you got up on the balcony today, if you're online, you get up on the roof of your house and jump off, you're probably going to hit the ground at some point? Anybody with me? Why is that? Gravity. gravity? Everybody say gravity. gravity. All right, when's the last time you saw gravity? Anybody ever roll, rode a roller coaster? Any, anybody remember the first time you flew? Anybody have any butterflies in their stomach? Why was that? Because you have faith that gravity exists to the point that it is a core belief. You don't think about it consciously. You don't, it's the fact that when you get in a high place and get close to the edge or something like that, there is something that enacts in you that goes, danger, Will Robinson, right? You will fall. Gravity is real. What if we had that kind of faith in God? That's where Jesus wants to take us. And here's what I'm going to tell every skeptic and doubter in the house today. I don't care where you're at on your spiritual journey. I am glad you're here today. You, you may call yourself a total devoted follower of Christ. You may call yourself, I don't believe any of that, kind of like Selvin did in the early days. Here's the deal. Every person in this room is a person of faith. All, we all are. It, it is the stuff life has made up. Now, there is a, a, a philosophy of life called nihilism or nihilism. Some of you know about it, and that is nihilistic speaking, nihilistic speaking. You believe that there is absolutely nothing, no meaning to life. It, it's all void. There, it's, not, it's just sort of an illusion, and you live, and life goes away, and it's just blah, right? Here's the crazy thing about people with that philosophy. They write books about it. I'm going to see if somebody's going with me already. Why would a person that believes nothing has meaning write a book? To get you to believe it, which means they have faith if they pin their ideas and Mark reads them, that just maybe you will come over to their side of believing life, which means they actually have what? Faith in something they can't see. Listen, guys, there is a, a great uh, book on this called Faith and Doubt. And there's a, a philosopher, I can't remember his name, I should have wrote it down, but he talked about the wager of life. And here's the deal. Are you ready for this? Everybody in this room is a poker player. And at some point, you're pushing most or all of your chips into one philosophy. Everybody here. You're like, any poker players in the house? It's okay, we're in church. I, use, I love to play poker. I'm, now, I don't do it anymore like I used to do it, but I still love the game. I love, and I love, how many love the Texas Hold'em tournaments, right? Yeah, some of you are praying for me. That's okay. I, I'm just being honest with you because Thomas was too. We're going to talk about this. But those moments when you push all in, right? Here's the deal, guys. When you see something in life, when I saw in 1994 and I walked in church and I saw this beautiful blonde woman singing on stage, and I'm like, whoa, right? I'm like, she's beautiful. She's at church, so she's probably a, a good person. It doesn't always work out that way. But, but I'm like, okay, cool, cool. She, she was leading youth ministry, leading worship. I'm like, I'm here to do youth ministry, do worship. Anybody know where I'm going? She's beautiful. Bonus! I, you know. And all of a sudden, just a few months in, as I talked to my pastor and some other people, I went, shh, I'm all in. And she, of course, went, of course I'm all in, Steve. No, I, I wasn't. 
I have some funny stories about that, but we won't talk about the night we were going to be engaged, and she got mad at me, and it was, I'm like, oh, Jesus. That was just a preview of things to come. And... <laughs> But here's the deal. What if I never went all in with Sarah? Now, we know that there are people here, you went all in and it didn't turn out like you wanted it. And listen, guys, I am sympathetic, empathetic of that. I've had failed relationships. I've had a lot of failures in my life. How many have messed it up in life once or twice? Raise your hand. You're in good company. Turn to somebody right now and say, we're in good company, baby. We're all being real here. One of the tragedies that Brian set up in his uh, Between the Lines video was this mislabeling of Thomas. And I want to read that passage with you. John chapter 20 in your Bibles. Go to the Gospel of John, which is right in the New Testament. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. This is one of the writings of the, uh, the disciple, the apostle John. John the Beloved, we call him. Uh, he also wrote 1st, 2nd, 3rd John and also wrote, we believe, Revelations as well. And he was writing his account of the story of Jesus, and he, he does the account of Thomas, which is very unique in this gospel, and it's not in the synoptic gospels. Everybody say not synoptic. Synoptic gospels are actually Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John's a little different. And so in the gospel of John, he says, Now Thomas, also known as Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. Now this is post-Jesus dying on the cross, and being resurrected from the tomb, and he's now going to appear to the disciples. But Thomas wasn't there. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. Yeah, awesome. And Thomas went, awesome, let's go out and do ministry. Let's do church. And that's not what he said. But he said unto them, read it with me, unless I see the nail marks in his hand, and put my finger where the nails were, and put my hand into the side, I will not believe. Now, the question you have to ask at this point of the scripture is who is Thomas? Was Thomas a disciple? Yes. Did, did he believe in Jesus' ministry or his mission on the planet? Yeah. Uh, was Thomas waiting for something? Was he there with the disciples, or is he, had he abandoned them? He's there with them. So Thomas has faith in something, but he's not quite there to believe that Jesus physically showed up in the room. Thomas had doubts, right? And we go on to see a great response. A week later, so seven days later, his disciples were in the house again, and who was there? Thomas, you got to ask yourself, if Thomas is the eternal skeptic, the doubter, the bad one, why is he there? There at some level was still faith in Thomas that Jesus is who he says he is and what's going to happen, although he's not sure about it, because remember, the disciples are kind of, kind of convinced that Jesus came to set up a government on the planet, right? They wanted the, him to overthrow Rome. There were the messianic prophecies. He's going to be king of kings, ruler of rulers, and they thought it was going to be now. But Jesus, come on somebody, had come to set up a different kingdom, a kingdom of your heart, a kingdom where it doesn't matter who's in office. Easy, easy po political people. You see, Jesus came to show us that you can have life, peace, joy, love, kindness, all those things in spite of your circumstances. And that, my friends, is only if you have the faith to believe. Watch me. There's something bigger than just this life. There's a, and this is, this is, everybody, this is why we love great movies, right? It's why we love the Avengers. I mean, my, my kids, how many Avengers movies are there? Like 200? <laughs> Hello, money, cha-ching. That's why I love Braveheart and Gladiator. That's why I love these. That, that there is something bigger in life than just what we see. Every person in here wants to think that my life matters on a scale that's going to outlive me. But oftentimes because of the culture doubt and the culture's secularism and kind of pulling 
God and, and this grander vision of life down to the scale of if you can't see it, don't believe it. It's no wonder that we live in a society full of depression and anxiety and suicide on, on a massive ride in a time where we are more connected, more medically sound than ever before. And the purpose of our life is still in question. A week later, his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, now here's the Star Trek moment. Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. I love this story. I, I wonder, did, did he like just pop in? Or did he like materialize like Captain Kirk? I'm a Star Trek guy. I think if I'm Jesus, I'm going to make it dramatic. Yeah, right? And he says, peace be with you. Why did he say that? Because they were scared. This, this guy just popped. And the, the crazy thing is, did, did Jesus call out Thomas? Did, did Thomas say, I'm sorry, Lord, or is it really you? I need to... He didn't say anything. Jesus said something. The first person he spoke directly to was Thomas. Don't you love this? Then he said to Thomas, put your finger here. See my hands. Everybody, everybody go just do this with me right now. Jesus said, see my hands. Then, then this is crazy. I, I'm going, Wow. He said, reach out your hand and put it into my side. Jesus is saying, Thomas, I love you, man. And I want you to see that your life has a massive purpose on this planet. And here's what he said to Thomas. Everybody read this last phrase with me because it's, it's the phrase for us today. Stop doubting and believe. Stop doubting and believe. In other words, what Jesus is saying to him here is, Thomas, I know you have faith, and I know you have doubt. And what God is saying to every person in this room, whether you like to admit it or not, you have faith on some level, but you also have what? Has anybody ever looked at what God does and go wonder, God, what are you doing, right? Why, why is it happening this way? Why did that person have to pass away? What's going on in life? Stop doubting and believe. And what was Thomas's response? Oh, Lord, I'm sorry. Oh, Lord, God, I, you know, I shouldn't have doubted. No, no, no. Because he knew that Jesus was speaking to him with love and calling out the best in him, Thomas uttered a phrase that is absolutely phenomenal. It's short, but it's powerful. Everybody say this with me. My Lord and my God. This is huge because... Thomas went from a compliant disciple to a committed disciple to watch a completely surrendered disciple of Jesus Christ. My Lord and my God, and my question for you today is when it comes to your life, guys, when it comes to the, how you're getting the quality of life, when it comes to how you define what a good life is, what are you putting your faith in and what are you putting your doubts in? And the even greater question is, when it comes to faith and doubt, faith, doubt, faith, doubt, do you live a life of faith? Or are you like many Americans today, watch this, you live a life of doubt, cynical, question everything, don't trust anybody, look out for number one. That's the society we live in today. We're more and more sarcastic, cynical. We don't trust a whole lot, right? How many have complete faith in the government right now? Right? How many are concerned about the government and its truth? Your ability to trust them. I never thought in my lifetime I would say, and I'm so thankful for the United States of America and for our military, but I'm starting to go, man, you start to see these rifts and politicizing of military stuff, and I'm going, y'all, that ain't good. Anybody with me? And I, and, I, and I pray for them, but here's the deal. If my faith for my quality of life is in my president and my governor and my generals, I might be in trouble. 
And this is what Jesus is trying to say to us. But I want to give you what I think is the most defining point of the message today that God was speaking to Thomas, that Jesus was saying to him, that I want to say to you, I believe it was God's word for you today. Guys, we all have doubts. Nobody has more doubts than Steve Glover about church, about God, about... But I, here's the deal. As Thomas did, I seek truth. And I choose to believe there is a God. I choose to believe that Jesus loved me, died for me, just like we sang about today, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son to die for Steve and for you, for your sons and daughters. But here's the deal, guys. When it comes to life, if you're taking notes, put this on the app, write it down. Do not let your doubt define you. Don't let your doubt define you. So many of us today are taught to live in a doubt. We live in a secularized nation, which is becoming more and more sort of non-Christian and even non-religious. More and more people claim to be non-religious in America than ever before. And, and I just want to go down the religious path because if we can get people to think in terms of faith in something greater than just this life, we can talk to them about, okay, is it Islam? Is it Judaism? Is it Christianity? Is it Hinduism? Is it Buddhism? What it is, whatever it is. If I can get someone to that conversation, then I can take them to the Word of God, to the evidence of historical context, and I can go, listen, what makes the most sense from a logical standpoint, but at a certain point, we all get to a point of faith. Well, we, a lot of us get to a point of doubt. We all have our doubts. But the question is, will I choose to live by my doubts or by my faith? In today's society, we often go, a lot of people go, when it comes to religion or Christianity or any of that stuff, guys, that's just a crutch. People... There's, you can't prove any of that. That is what we often call blind faith. Blind faith. And, and I don't have, people will say, I don't have blind faith because I have reasonable doubt. Right? I have reasonable doubts about the creation of the world and about God that I can't see him and all those things. But here's the deal. I heard a story. Luke and I were, were listening to an audio book. And a, science, a group of scientists went to God, and they said, God, we have so much technology now that we don't believe in you anymore, and we want to get this over with just finally. We, you know, we want to settle this today. So here's the deal. We can clone. We can splice the gene. We can do all those things. So let's have a little competition here. And he said, okay. I believe now we can create life. And that's really what science is after, right? We're going to create life. And so God says, okay, here's the deal. Then we got to go way back, and we're going to do it the same way. We, we, you know, we did it in the beginning from the dust of the earth, and we're going to create life, right? So the scientist said, awesome. So on your mark, get set, go. God reached down, and he pulls up a handful of dirt. The scientist reached down pulled up a handful of dirt, and God said, wait, 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 wait. He said, go get your own dirt. <laughs> now, the atheistic, agnostic, skeptics in the room are going, wait, 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 what's wrong with that joke? What's, let me figure this out, wait. But here's the deal. Luke and I were talking about it as we were talking about that illustration. We can talk about life. We can talk about all those things, but, but at some point you have to go to origins. And what we can't do is pinpoint how life started. The, the, the advancements of things that are going on in the world today are amazing, and I'm thankful again for medical advances where we can heal people and do great things. But there is this unbelievable need for the scientific community and the skeptic and the doubting community to prove and just rule out God, to rule out God. And let me tell you, if you rule out a creator, you have ruled out life and you have become nihilistic or nihilistic. Because if there is not a designer, you really have no purpose on this planet. In fact, what I'm doing right now is a set of random chemical reactions where you are going, and there's a process just for survival, and we're all going to go eat and die. 
But, here's what the evidence tells me. When I saw my daughter in her prom dress, prom dress, oh, Lord Jesus, help me, in her homecoming dress. Don't get there yet, Steve. Lord, have mercy. When I saw my beautiful youngest daughter this weekend all dressed up, first of all, I'm going, what guy do I need to shoot? I'm just kidding. <laughs> I was not it. It's a joke. I should not have said that. Sorry. That was a total joke. I was thinking about, I love my daughter. She's beautiful. I was thinking about how much I love her and I want to protect her. I I want her relationships to be great. I want her to have fun and all those kind of things. There was stuff in me that goes beyond just survival of the fittest. When I watched my son pitching in a baseball tournament yesterday and I'm watching their team literally get crushed and I'm feeling bad for him and I'm wanting him to do good and and then he's pitching and he does well and I'm proud of him and then he's up in the balcony so I won't mention the things he didn't do well but he did there's a couple things I'm but I want it you know I want him to succeed and I think about just that drive home and on the drive home from Bradenton we're we're looking over around seven o'clock to the west and it was one of those amazing Florida sunsets anybody know what I'm talking about it was just like to the, to the scope, a, a 10-year-old can appreciate the majesty of creation. And what I love about Luke, not to bl- blow his head up, was he said to me, I cannot believe, Dad, that people wouldn't believe in God. Now, I, again, I know that his doubts are going to come, right? He's going to grow up. He's going to have all the questions that Steve had, all the stuff. I'm not, I'm not oblivious to that. But what I know is this, guys. You choose to live in doubt? Or are you going to choose to live in faith? I believe this. To live in faith is to live. To live in doubt is to exist. Here's what I love about Thomas. And I want to tell you this today. If you're not a believer, or you're, maybe you've been burnt by church, or you kind of got a bad view of it. I've been there. I, I've been that guy. Here's what, what Thomas told us. Sincere faith does not prohibit, listen, guys, sincere investigation. You get that? Here's the cool thing. Thomas was a DC3-er. Thomas was real. He's the one who spoke his doubts, when Peter kind of pretended he didn't have any. Peter's like, Jesus, I'll die for you. And a day or two later, he did what? He denied him. Thomas is like, I don't see it. I like Thomas. Anybody like Thomas? He was a guy, he didn't have the church clothes. He didn't have the church language. He's like, I don't get it. You got to tell me. I got to see it. I need to touch it. There is nothing wrong with that. Because what it says about Thomas is, Thomas wanted to believe in Jesus so much that he put him in a place to investigate. And when, when God answered his doubts, you know what Thomas did? Brian talked about it. He picked up, left everything he had in Jerusalem, in Israel, and he went to India. First person, began to spread the gospel, planted church churches all along this coast of India and eventually died at the hands of another religion and he died a martyr proclaiming the gospel. That don't sound like a doubter to me, amen? That sounds like somebody that's not existing in doubt. They are living in faith. Jesus said at one point, do not let your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. My Father's house has many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I'm going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you with me, that you also may be where I am. He's telling this to his disciple. Jesus is speaking. You know the way. Watch this statement by Jesus. You know the way to the place where I'm going. Here comes Thomas. Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you're going. So how can we know the way? Don't you love that? Now, you've got to read into why did Thomas ask that question? Because he wanted to show Jesus up and show him how wrong he was? Why did Thomas ask Jesus, show us the way? Because he wanted to go there. Because he had faith, even though he couldn't see it, even though he had doubts, 
that there's a place that Jesus is preparing for me, which means I can live there with him forever. I can understand my purpose and, 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 and place on this planet, and I want to do that. And I'm going to tell you today, do you believe that about yourself? It is not an accident that you're on this planet. And the world is trying to fool us into thinking that if you spend 10 hours a day on this, that's life? That you live vicariously through the fantasies of Netflix and Hulu? That you live vicariously through the sport sport exploitations of other athletes while you sit there on the couch and eat chips and get fat like me? I'm just kidding. I'm serious. I want you to think about this. How much of us are so in doubt about your purpose in life that you've resigned yourself to the fact that it's not really real, that I live through the fantasy of the entertainment world, through the fantasy of seeing people's so-called life on social media? Anybody with me there? How many have been guilty of posting a picture and smiling, and then you're in an argument like two minutes later? Anybody besides me? You're arguing about how the picture looks, right? No, no, kids, get in line. you got to look happy now. I have relatives to show up. I have five kids. Some of you aren't blessed to know those scenarios. Here's what I want to leave with you today. you got to have faith, but I, I must tell you this as a minister, pastor of the gospel, because it's changed my life. There is one faith that will truly give you the way, and that's faith in Jesus Christ. You see, Jesus responded to Thomas' question, how can we know the way, with this amazing statement. Jesus answered, I am, say it with me, the way, the truth, and the life. Now, here's where it's going to get tense. Some of you believe that and you live it. Some of you say you believe it, but your life doesn't reflect it. I'm just being honest with you. You can go home. Your to-dos is to go home and think about these three. Some of you say it, and you know you don't really believe it. You say it to appease, to satisfy others, to put on a show. Yeah, I'm a man. I'm I'm a godly person. I'm a religious person, but you know you're not. Your God is little g, and it's you. And we've all been there because you put more faith in your ability and you live in doubt of everything else. And here's what Jesus says. He says, I come, I died on the cross for you. Faith in Jesus Christ, here's the deal, guys. Jesus said, believe, don't doubt. Faith in Christ Jesus erases the doubt. It erases your debt erases every deficit in your life. It puts you on the winning. It, it is the bet you need to make. I'm just telling you. Faith in Jesus Christ erases the doubt, the debt, and the deficits in our lives. And lastly, guys, faith in Christ gives us confidence, a clear conscience, and a life overflowing with blessings. You know what the cool thing about the blessings of life Why does God bless people? One reason. He loves to bless his kids, but he wants you to bless others. I love love watching the body of Christ when it's really clicking, when people really understand what it means to be a believer, is the fact that we live at peace. People are kind. They're gentle. People are honest about their doubts. That's really important in church that you can come and not be a hypocrite, but say, Steve, i got to struggle with this part of Scripture i got to struggle with how my wife's treating me or my husband's treating me and how I should. i got to struggle with my family, my kids. i got to struggle with some stuff in the Bible. But you're still seeking Jesus. I'm going to tell you, that's where you live in confidence. You live in a clear conscience. You know why you're on this planet. Don't let your doubts define you. Don't let your mistakes define you. Don't let your skepticism define you keep you from living the beautiful life of faith. One of the things I can say as a musician or anything in life is there's a point where we all get 
in front of someone and we play, and there's the risk of playing a wrong note. If you're a sports, an athlete, there's the risk of making an error or fumbling the ball or not passing the baton in the relay. If you're a dancer, there's a risk of missing the move, the choreography. If you're a business person, there's a risk that if I invest all this money and do all this work, it might not succeed. In marriage and family, there's a risk that, man, my kids may rebel or go a path that I don't approve of. So the choice is to go, I doubt, so I don't. Or I have faith, so I live. I'm going to tell you today, choose life. And if you really want to choose life, you choose Jesus. Let's pray. Father, I thank you today that you are the God of faith and doubt. God, I thank you today that you're going to spur some people on to a new step of faith. Some people are you're calling to start a business or to change jobs. Some people you're calling to, uh, Lord, to start a family to uh, volunteer in a local charity, a homeless Salvation Army. Some people, you're telling them to step out in faith and go apologize or to make a relationship that is broken to try to restore that. Some people, the biggest step they can take is to forgive someone, and they'll need your help, God, for that. But the biggest what if today for faith is there are people in this place that are not fully committed to Jesus Christ. And they know that it's not an accident. They're sitting here listening today. And I just encourage you right where you sit, on the beautiful note of Selvin's story, of the worship, of God's word, the story of Thomas, today is a day to say, Jesus, I want to give you everything, my faith and my doubt. And if you are here and you want to pray that prayer with me, here's what I want you to do. I want you to just pray a simple prayer. I can't do it for you. Just say, Jesus, I give it all to you. I am not perfect. I have plenty of failures. I give it to you. Lord, I I have successes, but I give those to you as well. Jesus, I want to give you everything. I'm not sure what it all means. Guys, this is not about joining DC3. It's not about joining church. It is about getting plugged in somewhere, but it's about saying today, from this day forward, I want to be totally devoted to Jesus, both faith and doubt. And he will grow your faith and diminish your doubt. You will learn to live more and more and not just exist. And for the rest of us here today, God, may we say, Lord, help us all to live in faith in that spirit of adventure as we step out to fight the battle you've called us to, to be light to the world, to be light in a dark place, to not look at circumstances and get caught up in the doubts, but to know that we serve the God who has it all in his hands. And we ask this all in the name of Jesus. And everybody said, amen. Turn to somebody as Pastor Brian comes to say, choose faith and live, baby. No doubt, no doubt. Solid word this morning, amen? Amen, thank you, Jesus. Hey, I encourage you, if you made a decision today to become a follower of Christ, to become a disciple of Jesus Christ, we'd love to know that. If you can simply text the word FORGIVEN to 941-208-0078, that would be awesome. And... If you are new here, you'd like to meet some of the DC3 team, then go through those double doors. And when you just before you get to the exit, look to your right where the cafe is. And some of our uh, team will be there to meet with you, to uh, answer any questions you might have, and just to say, hey. But hasn't it been awesome? Again, like I said, of all the places we could be, What an honor to be in his presence today. So, have a great day. And in all you say, in all we say, in all we do, may we honor him 
today and the rest of this week. Have a great day.